do as the Wrigley Institute to change that? And so working with the board and working with our development officer, um, Rob Woolley and others, the board came up with this great idea to sponsor a, a pitch initiative specifically for environmental issues. And we knew it would be a lot of work. We knew it would take a lot of effort to get enrollments. We were blown away that without a lot of work, we had 46 people sign up for the initial competition. Today, what we have here are the six finalists for that competition. And um, I'm, I'm really excited to see what you will present to us. The thing that I'm more excited about is that when I look at USC students, everybody comes here um, you know, to, to learn. You know, USC is a great institution. Everyone comes here to learn. What I see in you and what I've seen so far is that you have made the choice to come here to learn to make a difference. And that's a, that's a really nice subtlety to what our USC students represent. So I congratulate all of you for making it to this stage. Um, so what we would like to do is um, welcome and thank our judges. So our first, I'd like to introduce our judges. First of all, we have Amber Miller, the Dean of Dornsife College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. Dave Belasco, the co-director of the Lloyd Grief Center for Entrepreneurial Studies, welcome. Todd Bauer, the founder and the president of the Guardian Group and the conceiver of the Wrigley Prize. J.R. Johnson, the founder of Tripany, founder of CEO of virtualtourism.com. And finally, John Heidelberg, the interim director of the Wrigley Institute and the section chair for the uh, marine environmental biology section at USC. Since we're on a tight schedule, I want to give you some rules for today. Um, each team will be given five minutes to make their pitch and no more. Um, Chase Puentes, who is the coordinator for this entire program, will be your timekeeper. She will give you a one minute warning and then she will tell you when your time is up and we're going to hold firm to those time limits. All questions will be held until after all the pitches have been completed and then each judge will be allowed to ask each team one question. Then the judges will adjourn to deliberate and the rest of the audience will have an opportunity to ask more questions. So with that, I would like to start with um, our first team, which is Planty. And this is a classroom oriented growing experiment with full curriculum to reconnect children with food. The presenters are Jane Harris from the Marshall School of Business. And I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Just, and just letting you know. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Screen. There we go. How much do you think kids know about food? I was at the, go at the grocery store with my little cousin, visiting family, and tasked with making spaghetti for everyone, and he brought a jar of spaghetti sauce to the cart. When? I said, actually put that back, we're gonna make it from scratch, so let's get all the ingredients. And he looked at me and said, ingredients? I don't know what goes in that stuff. One in five children actually don't know where their food comes from. That spaghetti sauce actually comes from a tomato. So we thought, how do we reconnect kids to food? And it seems easy, right? Get them in a garden. And then discovered the challenge of getting an entire classroom to a garden. So we thought, why not bring the garden to them? I'm Jane, this is Emily, and we are planting. There's a growing disconnect in the US. Where one in three children are overweight or obese, Healthcare costs are rising, 40% of the food is wasted, so we thought education plays a huge role in moving the needle here. And school gardens are a proven solution from improving eating habits to even increasing test scores. But teachers lack the time and the resources to implement these programs. There's constraint around space and climate if you're not here in Southern California, and a gap in standards of 1,000 hours of child's a class, an average of three are spent on food nutrition education. What if there are a way to teach kids about food and nutrition in a fun and playful way with science, engineering, and technology in any classroom anywhere. Well, now there is. Meet Planty, the tabletop aeroponic garden lab designed with teacher and student in mind. For the teacher, it comes with a full circle curriculum around the science standards they need to teach in the classroom. And for students, it's hands-on, interactive, and the transparent design allows them to be a part of the entire process from seed to stem. 
So if you look at what else is on the market now, there's some other tabletop gardens that you might have seen, Cook and Grow, Air Garden, but they lack any curriculum or interactive elements to really bring them into the classroom. And then we think with curriculum, it really lacks the technology or standards to bring them to the classroom. So, so Planty really stands out. And because of this, we actually have five customers that are ready and excited to purchase, and they are education-focused <coughs> nonprofits. So they're already running programming in schools. There's about 8,000 of them like that here in the US spending 80% of their budget on programs, making for a $13.4 billion market. Now they already have the relationships and the structure in place to buy plantings from us and implement them in the classroom, allowing us to really get inside and kind of bypass the traditional education and entry way. So focusing on them for our first phase of our business model um, is the education programs. Really, like I said, working our way from the inside so we can expand our market, and then going into phase two, hitting e-commerce and focusing more on the education distributors like Lakeshore, school districts, the homeschool market, which is ever growing, and the educational toy market, and really capitalizing on the ed tech space, which is expected to be 250 billion by the year 2020. So where are we now? Since January, we built two versions of the prototype, second version here, um, scheduling to build seven devices that we're gonna pilot in summer programs and in the early fall, and work with those partners to also develop the curriculum simultaneously onboard a curriculum director who can really bring all of that curriculum full circle and make sure it's aligned to standards. And at the same time, hit up all of our um, conferences and trade shows for the education space. Um, ready, ready to launch in spring of 2018. And looking at our financials in year one, really focusing on that first education program market, like I mentioned, um, getting 116K, that's about 900 units, and then growing by year five in both markets, or all markets, to 10 million which will actually enable us to impact over half a million students. So in addition to measuring the students that we touch, also continuing to make sure that we're in line with the science standards as it continues to change. Also measuring the amount of interactions the students have with the device, so we know how much they're touching it, how much they're learning and engaging. And also the number of schools and classrooms that we're in, so we really understand how many um, communities we're touching and what they look like de demographically and geographically, so we can see who we're touching. And to do all of this, we have an amazing team of ladies from the Viterbi School of Engineering and the Marshall School of Business here at USC with over 16 years of experience in marketing, product engineering, nonprofit, and even toy design. Um, we're, like I mentioned, we're looking for a curriculum director, and we have a beautiful team of advisors from a curriculum developer for a toy robotic program that teaches kids coding, elementary age students, um, a director from a, a learning academy here in LA, a CFO for an education focused nonprofit, like I mentioned, for our first market, and even a former tour designer from Mattel. So, with that, we're really excited to keep going, and thank you for your time today. We hope you will join us in planting these seeds to grow a healthier generation. All right, our next presenter is going to be Kevin with Aquas. My name is Kevin Cassell. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about Aquas and our affordable water filters. I was in high school when I traveled to Ecuador with my surf team to teach English at an elementary school. But when I got there, something shocked me a lot. I learned that just the week before, the school lost one of their students. A little seven-year-old girl that we died from diarrhea from lack of access to clean water. And I didn't get it. To be honest, I still don't get it. 
because we know how to solve this problem, yet people die every single day. Um, and it inspired me to start a nonprofit, a Club H2O, to distribute water filters around the globe. And today we've provided tens of thousands of people with access to clean water in over 32 different countries. But I learned a bigger problem overall in this space, and that's that when the World Health Organization talks about water, they say that 700 million people lack access to clean water. What I'm here to tell you today is that we're not talking about the right number because over 3 billion people on our planet right now rely on extremely expensive, outdated, and polluting treatments in order to make their water safe to drink. To put this in perspective, imagine you're from Mexico. There are three ways that you're interacting with water right now, and that's you lack access to clean water altogether, one. Two, you are boiling water either with wood or on a stove. Or three, you are buying bottled water. This picture in Africa, statistically speaking, each person probably has three cell phones, yet every single day they're using these bags of water. This is the world we live in. So what we've created is a solution that has the potential to literally change the way the world interacts with water. We've created an affordable, income-generating water filter, and without electricity, pumps, or chemicals, we can, the AquaSafe water filter can treat 1,400 liters of water per day for over three years. I'm going to do a quick demo. Um, simply put, if you can boil the water to make it safe to drink, you can use the AquaSafe water filter because it's a step better than that. So totally clear, tastes great. Also have a few samples for the judges as well. <laughs> Uh, and then anyone who wants to try it can totally come up after. But one of the coolest parts of this product oh, is yeah. that because it's extremely high flow rate, it actually allows poor customers to become water entrepreneurs, which means that they can generate a supplemental income by selling water to people in their communities. And because of its income generating capabilities, microfinance banks will actually give loans to these customers to buy it if they can't purchase it outright. This unlocks not only the most overlooked, but the biggest customer base in the entire world, and that's the global core. Our competition is substitutional. However, other filters do, other filters do exist, but simply put, we're hands down the most cost-effective water treatment solution and the only product in existence that has an ROI for this customer base. Our business model is simple. Right now we're working on large institutional buyers currently working with the Panamanian government who is doing a small scale test before implementing it large scale. Price Mart, the Costco of Central America, we're customizing large scale orders, think 50,000 units plus, for political campaigns in developing countries, as well as strategic partners like microfinance banks. Um, I'm gonna go through this really quickly with a couple of examples of who our customer is. So in the charity aspect, you have David, who's the founder of the Crossover School. And out of his 300 students, every single year, half of them were suffering waterborne disease, sometimes dying. And after receiving six water filters, six AquaSafe water filters, just like this one, that number's now zero. That is $220 worth of impact, to put that in perspective. Dr. Paul, an anesthesiologist, the home, family, steady income, was boiling water on the stove and has completely eliminated that inconvenience. And I think most exciting, Alonzo, an entrepreneur, was buying four 16-liter bottles of water a week for five to seven dollars. And that means he was spending $1,400 a year on water. With a $35 investment, he has completely eliminated that cost. What I'm saying is that this isn't just a poor person problem. You know me, my name is Kevin Casal. We have a career of business development with her experience in international team building and sales. An amazing set of advisors with Jessica Jackley from Kiva, Phil Wilson from Ecofiltro. We just passed $20,000 in revenue this week and can produce half a million units a year today. Um, moving forward, we're building our team hiring, expanding, launching second product. They're just patent pending. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Jenny Liu with Interphase. Switching gear a little bit, has anyone heard of winglet? It's this little bending of tip of airline wings that can reduce fuel consumption by 5% to 
saving, saving avian industry millions, billions of dollars every year. This is exactly the same thing we're trying to, to transform the energy efficiency. Um, my name is Jenny from Interface Materials. We have a non-toxic heat transfer enhancement coating that can improve power generation efficiency by 5 to 10 percent. Let me first simply define what heat transfer heat exchange is. It actually is no different than in tailgate. We use an ice bucket to cool down our beer. Like in this diagram, the large water, uh, cold water bath outside is trying to pull the hot water running through the small pipe inside the large tube. This the technology has been around for decades, widely used in the power generation industry because it's critical to power generation. However, over time, because the water is in contact with the air, we have problems as corrosion scale buildup. This has caused very expensive inefficiency. Not only is it expensive to clean or change the equipment, but it's very expensive wasting the resources we have for energy generation, which is coal and other natural resources. In terms of the environment, it's even more expensive when you consider the CO2 emission going out of the air every year, which is a major contribution to global warming. Our solution is a nano coating that is simply mixed with water, dumped into the sump. As the water flushes through the system, the material will bind to the surface of the heat exchangers and create a thin one molecule layer coating. And we currently have two patterns pending on this coating that is increase the heat transfer efficiency by 5 to 10 percent and also prevent biofouling. I'll show in this picture. Uh, industrial standard pipe under four months fresh water flushing through the heat exchanger pipe start growing algae and with interface material you see a smooth surface. From a report from EPRI, which is the forms or the nature of the power industry depending on where your background is from, uh, this kind of heat transfer enhancement can save a mid-sized power plant six million dollar in cost saving per year and 400,000 tons of carbon emission. And we're proud to say our material is eco-friendly. Currently, the solution to kill this kind of filing is water treatment, which is dumping chemicals such as chlorine in the system, try to dissolve these, these filings. Um, unlike water treatment, we don't treat the water, we treat the surface directly. Our coating is uh, non-toxic, so the chem the, our customers don't need to spend a lot of money to treat the discharge at the end of the day before disposing, and they don't need to spend money by these expensive water treatment uh, equipments. So our market is water treatment combined with heat exchanger is over $5 million just thinking about power sector. We reach our customers through direct sales. We currently have one customer doing a pilot project with us, a contract size of $25,000 uh, with a sewer power plant. We have three others actually talking to us in the sales pipeline. We also have additional partners and customers in, in utility. Power and U.S. Navy helping us to test our technology, gain more data to eight sales, and the contract in total is over two hundred thousand dollars. Our model is fee for service. Um, first year we try to code a couple condensers in the power plant, charging customer hundred thousand dollars, getting them profit a gain of over nine hundred thousand dollars. Starting a second year, we try to code all their condensers once a year, charging half a million dollar and getting the additional profit of five and a half million. Taking out our cost, our profit is around 55%. Now I'll take a minute and go back to my story. About a year ago, I was working at the Innovation Institute in University of Pittsburgh, just reviewing disclosure form, looking at how, what technology pattern and how to help scientists, doctors, to go through this 10-year regulation pathway to commercialize a technology. That's where I met Noah and Casey. They were not only scientists, but also change makers that want to use their technology, which is a neural implant coding back then, to other industries where they can immediately have benefits and social impact. Over time, we have built our company to team of eight with a very strong science team and a business team with MBAs from the Marshall School of Business here. We also have advisors with deep relationship in the power industry and water treatment to help us gain relationship with our customers to understand their needs. Remember, we're saving 400,000 tons of CO2 emission every year per plant uh, per year. Uh, we have the commitment to safety and we're driving sustainable energy business. With the prize money from Wrigley, we try to build a mock heat exchanger on the Catalina Island to execute our Navy project to test our technology in the real marine environment. Thank you very much for your time today. Up next, we have Camille and Kyle and Willie with Reflow. 
Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Camille. These are my teammates, Willie and Kyle. We're helping universities save water and money, and we're here from Reflow Water Technologies. So as most of you know, we've recently came out of a drought that lasted over five years. And for most people, this meant conserving water wherever possible, using drought-friendly lawns or buckets in the shower. But for me, when I was a freshman living in USC storms, all I knew was that I wasn't seeing my water bill. More importantly, my parents weren't seeing my water bill. So who cares how much water I use? This is the problem that exists with water use on college campuses, is that there's this huge disconnect between the people who use the water and the people who pay for the water and track how much water is used. So once I did some research, I found this number. 29.3 million gallons of water are used in USC's showers every year. This is enough to fill the football field and the Coliseum with 60 feet of water. That's absurd. So when I found this, I felt so bad. I was like appalled at the gluttony of my freshman year self for using all this water in the shower and contributing to this giant number. But hindsight is 2020. So we started thinking, what would I have done differently if I'd been able to see how much water I was using as I was using it? And this is what we've done with Reflow. We have a real-time water tracker and display of use in the shower water use in the shower. This is our water tracker. It's a little flow meter. It attaches to the shower head. And we have the in-shower display screen, or water dashboard as we like to call it, which uses gamification to show you exactly how many gallons of water you're using in your shower and drives competitive energy because you're competing with other people in your dorm, on your floor, or even other universities. Can you guys imagine having this during Conquest? Just one more way to show them that we're better. <laughs> So our target market are the 810 universities that already have clearly defined water conservation goals. Some examples. Harvard spends almost a million dollars every year on water conservation, and the UC system spends a whopping three million dollars per campus per year on water conservation alone. So this equates to our target market of 800 million dollars per year. The competition in this space largely consists of other methods that universities could be using to reach their water conservation goals. However, our unique data-driven approach uses gamification to maximize water savings and ensure lasting behavior change. This year, we're working on hardware development, and we're also working with the Department of Housing Sustainability to implement a pilot program in one of the dorms this coming fall. Next year, we would like to roll out our solution across the entire living laboratory that is USC's campus in order to uh, aggregate data on large-scale water savings as well as on the Wrigley Institute in Catalina. Moving forward, we would like to roll out our solution into more universities that have similar sustainability goals. But with our product, it's our aim to position USC and the Wrigley Institute as leaders in the water conservation space. At scale, it costs us $100 to produce, produce the hardware, which we can sell for $340 per unit, which is in line with the sustainability 2020 metric for waters of ga gallons of water saved per dollar invested. Additionally, we'll charge a subscription fee of $1 per unit per month for the data management service that we provide. This will give us $760,000 in revenue our first year and $27,000 for every year after. This $27,000 actually saves $90,000 in water and energy costs for the university. So we're a team of highly skilled engineers and business students right here from USC. We also have a great lineup of advisors who are experienced in the social entrepreneurship space as well as the water conservation space. And we're looking to hire a full stack engineer. So once our solution is completely rolled out across USC's campus, we can save 3.8 million gallons of water and influence 9,000 students every single year. This way, USC can truly cultivate a culture of sustainability throughout every member of the Trojan family. But why stop there? Once our solution is rolled out the in, across the entire United States, we can save over 2 billion gallons of water and influence almost 5 million people every single year. This is the impact we can have when we work together to make water conservation a way of life. Thank you guys so much for listening. All right, up next we have Monty Hassan with Topiku. Hi, I'm Monty Hassan, a senior undergraduate and the founder and CEO of Topiku. Topiku means my hat in Indonesian. 
We're tackling the global waste management problem in the fashion industry by creating an apparel line handcrafted from 100% upcycled and recycled materials. 80 billion square meters. That's the amount of square meters of, of uh, fabric that is sent to landfills each year as leftover waste from textile production. In developing countries such as Indonesia, these landfills end up overflowing and clogging up rivers, streets, and gutters, among other hazardous environmental impacts. It was actually a first-hand encounter with such a river that uh, allowed Topiki to happen. So uh, on, on, on a trip to a village, the river was flooded and uh, ended up having to turn around and run it ran into our future manufacturers. Uh, our solution. We started with creating a pair line out of 100% upcycled and recycled materials. In the past year, we've developed and nurtured supply side partnerships that allow us to scale and did over $25,000 in sales last year. The ex expenditure on ethical fashion continues to grow, with, with shoppers continuing to place more emphasis on conscious consumerism, with a 43% growth to $3.6 billion in 2015. The Topiku difference. Together with the ha our hat makers in the village of Chigondewa, Indonesia, together with our, yeah, we, we utilize 100% upcycled and recycled materials. So instead of using the standard version PVC plastic for our brims, we utilize plastic buckets, which are salvaged from landfills, crushed, melted, and then remolded into brims. We look to the surrounding manufacturing communities for the rest of our sourcing. We upcycle leather scraps from, garment, or from shoemakers and belt makers into the patches and straps of our hats. Uh, we upcycle the rest of our upcycled garment cloth from uh, uh, garment production and uniform production in the surrounding communities. All our partnerships are with local home industries, which are uh, allow us to you know, really have a communal impact. So our community in Chigonde was the only employer of women in the area. So we were able to provide both men and women with flexible ethical jobs, as well as to help spread our, uh, create a system that is, that is scalable. Our business model. So we were able to produce our hats for just over $5 a piece and sell them for $35. With these large margins, we were able to reinvest into sponsorship for health insurance as well as fund both waste management education programs and cleanup programs in the villages we work with. This is all through our partnership with Waste for Change. And now we are starting to expand our business model as we collaborate with, uh, with other brands who are in search of ethically made apparel, which is opening a whole new avenue for our business model. Pictured here is Ninda. Ninda is our shirt maker. So around two years ago was when I first met her. And she was, you know, she, was, she started a apparel manufacturing business as a side project to generate extra revenue for her husband. She sewed every single shirt by hand. Fast forward to today, and now she employs five artisans and is a confident businesswoman. This is just one story of dozens of artisans' lives we help impact through Topiku. Now you might be wondering, how does a USC student find a rural Indonesian village 9,000 miles away? In the summer of 2014, I volunteered for an NGO and proposed to them a hat upcycled from a car seat vinyl. Long story short, they rejected my idea. So <laughs> next year, uh, which was the summer of 2015, I returned in search of a hat manufacturer. On the way to the village, it was raining and the road was flooded due to trash clogging the gutters. So we had to turn around and stop and ask for directions in a random village. So we talked to a random guy who asked, what's a white guy like you doing over here? And I responded, I'm looking for a hat maker. And the guy responded, I'm a hat maker. And the rest of this year. <laughs> So we're the team to make it happen as a team of all USC undergraduates. My co-founder, Anthony, is a Teal Fellow and also recently built and sold his uh, multi-million dollar startup, Envoy Now. So with Topiku, we are, with, with more orders, we are able to save more trash, which equals more profits for home industries, which equals more opportunity for both men and women to work. So with our commitment to industrial ecology in these areas, we will create the strong foundation for economic and social impact in these developing communities. Uh, join us as we help scale up our impact. Thank you so much. All right, up next we have Andrew Sicola with Sanitation Research. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Witherspoon. I'm the COO and co-founder of Solving Shit, a social enterprise working to solve the issues of open defecation and sanitation in India. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar, in India alone, over 600 million people currently practice open defecation, making up just under 60% of the global total. As you can imagine, the health effects are extremely severe, as over 200,000 children under the age of five die every year from diarrhea alone, and hundreds of thousands of more are chronically stunted due to uh, 
chronic, permanently stunted due to chronic malnutrition. Now, we looked at kind of where this all starts and that how difficult it is and why it's extremely difficult for people in India to get a toilet. Now, we've identified three core issues behind that being space, cost, and land. Now, looking at their traditional toilet solutions being pit latrines, they actually require not only the can, which you see here, but the actual pit below and then the uh, brick and mortar superstructure above. So specifically in urban environments, but even in rural, uh, rural environments, the actual space constraint is extremely, uh, extremely difficult for them to overcome. And then when you talk about uh, dealing with the world's poorest demographic, at a cost of 12,000 to 15,000 rupees, or about $200, while it doesn't seem extremely expensive, is a high cost for them to take on. And then for land, specifically in urban environments, where the majority of people don't actually own the land they live on, there is no way for them to build these permanent structures, and so it's impossible for them to actually have access to any sort of toilet. And so this is where our solution comes in. Our solution is an affordable toilet partnered with an a low-cost waste management solution. Our toilet is waterless, electricity-free, portable, and low-cost, offering a private and personal experience to anyone who uses it. And our waste uh, removal service is inexpensive, efficient, scalable, and it's actually self-powered. Now, our toilet, as you can see on the left, works as this. You would stand on the standing bin, which is made of locally sourced materials such as wood, squat over the bowl, relieve yourself into the bowl, your waste would flow then into the collection bin below, and your business is done. Now, what actually is covering the bowl as well as the collection bin is called a super hydrophobic polymer, which really all that means is it makes the bowl as well as the collection bin extremely resistant to water. So when you defecate in the bowl, as our waste is roughly 90% water, it actually is repelled down the bowl, leaving no residue, leading to its extremely <coughs> clean and sanitary nature. Now, this can hold a family of five's waste for roughly four to five days. Now, this is where the second piece of our solution comes in, being the waste management. Now, how our model would look is this. We would identify and uh, train a local entrepreneur who would be the salesman behind this toilet and subscri subscription service. He would then hire a team of extra extractors who with uh, small bikes would service every house that purchased one of our toilets. With uh, minimal PVC piping, they can actually access the toilets from, in, from outside the house, pumping out the waste and taking it to a local processing facility. Now, while processing facility sounds expensive and fancy, really all it is is a rudimentary biodigester, which uses bacteria to break down waste into biogas and fertilizer. Now, we use that biogas to actually power our transportation fleet, leading to the uh, self-powered piece of our management service. Now, uh, while we have been extremely confident from the start in this solution, we knew that we didn't have a solution until we actually got to India and tested it on the ground. And so over spring break, that's exactly what we did. We traveled to New Delhi where we not only had the opportunity to meet with actual customers and get their feedback, but we met with a number of established groups in the sanitation space, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Water Aid, Wash Institute and received resounding positive feedback from all of them. Now that has led us to our next steps, which is we identified a urban resettlement colony, Sabibu, just outside of New Delhi, where we will roll out our first 400 toilets and our first processing facility uh, over the summer. So over the next three months, we will build our first 400 toilets and processing. And with $50,000, we can provide sanitation to 2,000 people, and both the local entrepreneur and ourselves can be profitable within the first year. So join us and solve shit. <laughs>
But before I tell you more about this crop, let's talk about one you do know, the almond. The almond is an extremely thirsty crop. It takes more than one gallon of water to produce one single almond. And in our home state of California, the world's largest producer of almonds, this means tons of water. 10% of our state's water supply, one trillion gallons, goes directly to almond production. And as, and as climate change intensifies and water becomes more scarce, this comes at a cost. A recent study by UC Davis estimates that in the past two years alone, water shortages have cost the agricultural industry in California $3 billion and tens of thousands of jobs, much of which can be tied directly back to the almond. So here's my alternative, the Bombara groundnut. The Bombara groundnut is an indigenous legume that thrives in the arid, bone-dry deserts of sub-Saharan Africa. Bombara has the rare distinction of being both a drought-tolerant crop and a complete food based on its high levels of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Bombara is so nutritious, people can survive eating it alone. Some of the other benefits is that it embodies climate-smart agriculture because it doesn't require any other inputs like fertilizers or pesticides. And it promotes food security because as it grows, it excretes nitrogen back into the soil around it, helping other crops to thrive. Thirdly, it's only grown today by smallholder women farmers for subsistence levels because there's no outside market. Women farmers go largely unrecognized, so if we're able to open up lucrative international sales channels, we can empower these women with additional sources of income. And creating global demand isn't hard because Bombara has the same end applications of, such as almonds and soy, like being made into a milk, Bombara milk. Um, I have some Bombara milk for you to test or, or for you to taste during the Q&A. Um, the dairy alternative milk market is valued at $13 billion globally. And here in the US, this market has seen tremendous growth reaching a billion dollars in sales last year. Almond milk leads the category with 65%, but all segments are seeing increasing demand as consumers are easily adopting new and innovative products. Here's a closer look at our competition. And our main competitor, White Wave Foods, which produces all of the silk products, was actually just acquired for $12 billion by, um, by Dannon. But let me draw your attention to this first column here. It takes 20 gallons of water to produce a single glass of almond milk. Now, Bambara, on the other hand, only requires a half a gallon of water, <coughs> making it 40 times more water efficient. Bambara is the only product to be a high source of protein, have no dietary restrictions, and to have a social impact. <laughs> Believe in Bambara is a social enterprise, and our main objective is to create positive social and environmental change that's easily quantifiable. In our first five years of operations, we'll work with 1,500 farmers for a total water avoidance of 16 million gallons of water. With the money that we pay uh, the farmers for their labor and their harvest, this will increase their yearly income by 75% to help them better support their families. Our business model is based off the highly successful contract farming model you'll find in fair trade coffee and cocoa. We, over the past 18 months, my co-founder and I have worked directly with established farming cooperatives. So we'll be able to work directly with hundreds of farmers, cutting out expensive middlemen and improving our margins. It's a win-win situation because we're able to pay them an above fair market value while also helping them increase their yields through improved seeds and enhanced farming techniques obtained from local research institutes. We're well on our way and have already made significant progress. We received $15,000 in funding so far and our first harvest of Ambara was planted in March. I'm going to Ghana this summer to collect our harvest and transport it to prepare it for processing for our first trial production run. Um, luckily, I have an extensive network of resources as I've worked for both Starbucks and Diageo. Diageo is one of the world's largest beverage manufacturers, and I've worked for them for five years rotating through different supply chain functions like bulk liquid logistics, raw ingredient management, and third-party packaging. As I learned how to create and sell beverages, I saw huge inefficiencies and damaging manufacturing processes. So today, I offer you the opportunity to believe in Bambara and join me in empowering women, conserving water, and offering consumers a delicious and nutritious plant-based milk. Thank you. All right, thank you all. We're gonna open it up to the Q&A now. So each judge will get one question. We'll try to keep it to three minutes per question. Um, we can start with Todd and go down the line. Wait, so, Chase, just, to, just to clarify. Yes. We're doing one question for the entire group, right? One not, question per judge. Not per company. 
right? One right. question per judge per company. So no, 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 not no. per company. For, One for question. Elephant. You get to pick your most important question, just in the interest of time. So you're not going to get to. You're not going to get to. So we'll go through this <laughs> once, and then if we have time, you can go back and get your second question. Because we might be here all day. Because so many questions you're writing down. <laughs> I will, and I will pass. I, I will yield my time to the. The gentleman's no, right. <laughs> I've been working with these guys a lot. I've already asked them hundreds of questions. So yeah. We can skip me, but let's get the rest of the jokes. So, I guess just one question in general across the board is how much money they each require. I think I saw it addressed in one plan, but how much funding is each required to get you to your next step? And I'm not sure I saw that. Okay. So, that's just across the board with everybody, and that would be my question. Okay. Do you want all the teams to come down in front? Yeah, why don't you guys all, yeah, why don't you guys all come down so we can just give you a little some rapid fire Q&A. Did you say one question that we have to ask to all of them? No, 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 no,
saving water, and it's also very different than selling to like a company where they have to meet a bottom line every quarter. Um, so we thought that would be a great place to start, but we're also looking at expanding into hotels, and um, a lot of hotels are creating similar sustainability goals for themselves, um, kind of as like a PR thing, but also you know they need to know these numbers so that they can hit them, and I think what we could give them would be the data portion. Um, I don't think the gamification thing would work so well, like you're competing with Sweet Bee, but, um, <laughs> uh, but definitely I think they would be very interested in the data. Have you thought about where else the gamification piece could work? I think like directly for consumers in their homes is another place um, that we've heard that people are very interested just from us talking about it to our friends. Um, so that's another area as well where the gamification could definitely come into play, um, like within communities and things like that. I will take a question. So Monty, on your on your uh, company, so you've got your direct to consumer model where you're selling your stuff, and it sounds like you've got a uh, kind of more of a uh, so you're supplying other large clothing brands. How do you see your business developing? Is it more direct to consumer? You're going to become a manufacturer for other brands. Definitely. So originally when we started, we just wanted to focus on creating our own transparent supply chain so we could be like the top ethical sustainable hat manufacturer. And now from creating that for ourselves, we've uh, and receiving inquiries from other companies who want us to create their branded products for them. So this usually comes from other social enterprises who are interested in making their own branded apparel, but they, they don't have, they don't want to pay uh, or work with a non-ethical uh, manufacturer that doesn't go along with their ethos. So we kind of fit in there as a sustainable middleman uh, between the bridge between these local village manufacturers and an international market. So uh, as we move towards that, we want to we're currently working on two collaborations, and by the end of the year, we want to hit at least uh, uh, five or ten collaborations in the morning. I've got a quick question for the Planty team. In terms of your cost, who are you sourcing the manufacturing of your product to? So we're currently speaking with, right now we're doing all of our manufacturing for prototypes at LACI, the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. Uh, but we'll be working with one manufacturer, and the one we're looking at is Jetta. And those materials will we'll be working with them to figure out what types of materials are best for the product and make sure that they're sustainable and recyclable, but also resistant to children. Okay. We have time for one more question for each judge. So much to ask. <laughs> <laughs> this is just fascinating. Uh, I guess uh, Holly from Bavar. Uh, so this. What happened to the superfood? Why, why is it better known? Do you have any on you? And, <laughs> and, and is this like you know the case of acai in Brazil, where all of a sudden it became this really popular thing? Is it something that? Uh, I mean, my ultimate question is, what competitive advantage do you have versus anyone else to harvest this and distribute? Um, yeah. So a couple of things there. Um, so if you guys want to help yourself, so that is fresh milk I made this morning. Um, is it dairy? It is non-dairy, no, no, there's no lactose um, at all. Um, there's two different kinds right there. So the reason it's not everywhere and globally today is that it's, there's a couple of different reasons, but it's been historically stigmatized as a woman's crop. So therefore it hasn't been given any investment in by science and technology and therefore it's just been passed over for other crops. So that's kind of the largest reason about why you haven't heard of it today. Um, and this is not a perfect recipe. You'll see there is a very distinct taste. It has a very distinct beany taste to it. Um, and uh, what were some of the other questions? What's, what's the competitive advantage that you have versus Monsanto from Sure, no, absolutely. I mean, the research institutes that we've talked to, so we've connected with everybody that we could find that knows anything about Bambara, and it's a handful of people. There's just not that many people that have invested time and energy into it. And so there's um, a scientist in Cape Town who has two patents in processing it into a milk and a yogurt. And she said that, that, that some people have approached her, but nobody is really taking it seriously. They've just, they've just seen other opportunities elsewhere. So honestly, I think it's the fact that I do see the potential, and um, and it's also the social empowerment piece of it. The consumers, the consumers care. Consumers here want to know where their products are coming from. They want that transparency, and they're willing to pay a little bit more for it. So, I had a question for you also, but more in terms of the scale up. So, if you're talking about trying to take the small farmer model, the free trade kind of coffee model, mm -hmm. and competing with giant al almond growers, for mm -hmm. example, um, what does that look like? 
Yeah, and I mean, it's not a direct comparison. It's not like we're gonna take market share directly from almond milk you know, in their first five years. It's really gonna be just like a supplemental product that it might fill a different space than almond milk fills. It might be more of a, a ready-to-go drink, like more of a smoothie type thing that you eat in the morning for, for nutrients and protein versus you know, put it in your coffee, that sort of thing. So honestly, we see it as not a direct competitor because it is so different. And almond milk just doesn't have that much protein in it. So we kind of see our positioning ourselves as just kind of a totally separate category. So you've done the taste test. What are people thinking about the taste test? Yeah, so you guys are my second official taste test. <laughs> I, um, I'm in the fellowship program here with the, social, um, with the social enterprise lab here on campus. So I did it with my fellows and all of them went back for seconds, which was a really good sign. Um, and then the, universe, the professor in Cape Town, she's done a taste test with 100 um, consumers and all of the sentiments were very positive and people indicated they'd be willing to buy it and pay for it and, and that sort of thing. So everything's been really positive so far. So what did you guys think? Tastes healthy. healthy. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between the two? Um, so the the one on the left that's a little bit darker, that is a fresher um, variety that I got from Malaysia. Um, and then the one on the right I got off of Amazon, so it's not very fresh. Um, and I added a little bit more water just to kind of help dilute it a little bit. Um, and then that one in your hand has agave and cinnamon, and the other one has just honey. We didn't ask what interface materials we want to ask a question. Um, and, and congratulations for like, it's an unsexy business, but it's something that, no, like the MBAs, people overall look unsexy businesses. There's a lot of money to be made there, because everyone's used to technology. But what, um, what IP, what intellectual property do you have that can give you, you know, a lead and be able to make yeah, so uh, the coding itself is intellectually protected. We applied a patent on it. Um, what type of patent? Sorry? What type of patent? So one patent was already on the first year through the second process. The other one was just applied earlier <coughs> this year. Um, they're both on the formulation and the, the uh, different components and the chemicals we're putting in there. Um, I have a slide on that. It's a little bit harder to explain. Basically, uh, current coding, when you put it on top of any material, it's kind of like spider webs, it's like a cell in different layers on it, we were able to formulate to have only one molecule thick on top of it. So it's very thin, it doesn't insulate the material to prevent heat transfer, but and, uh, it changes the thermal energy off the surface, surface material, actually enhances the heat transfer. Uh, Sorry, so I, I I don't know if I can answer your no, question. No, you, you asked the question, but yes. I have, we have so many more questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've got another five minutes. Okay. All right, keep firing away then. Let's do All right. This. For reflow, where do you plan on manufacturing the product? Um, so we have uh, partnerships with a, some contract manufacturers in the Bay Area who have presence in Asia as well. And the game plan is to begin stateside first while our volumes are below 3,000, say, and there will be a certain mark when it makes sense to move it overseas to really get at that $100 number. Um, so initially, we'll probably be a bit more expensive, especially at the prototype stages, um, but we will rely heavily on the contract manufacturing partner to help us through the DFM process. Can you do about the display? Can you do about the display? Installing displays in showers seems like that's gonna be a new um, totally. Um, <clears throat> so the biggest thing is actually, I mean, you can't take your phone in the shower. And when you have the screen, Some do. <laughs> sure, yeah, uh, you can. But I mean, the biggest thing that we've realized is that you need to know right there how much water you're using. And when you see that screen on the wall next to the handle, you're going to say, oh, I'm coming up. I've passed the dorm, my, I passed my floor mates down the hall. I've used so much more water, I'm gonna shut it off right now. So just giving that information in real time um, is really critical, but yeah, we can do it with the, with the app. There's a, there's a product market thing that I think that uh, you, you're, you're on a problem and the solution is there, whether it's a timer, I know the real time data, the cost of, what was it, 300 something bucks? Um, 
you've seen those stickers just by, uh, you know, we all want to be conscious of it. The stickers just yeah. in front of your towels that say, this comes from trees. This sticker alone saves X many. Yeah. So you're, you're in the right space. Just the, the installation of yeah. So congratulations on it. Thank you. How did you guys, can you tell, tell them a little bit more about how you guys came up with the $340 number before that? So we went, compared ourselves to other investments that Sustainability 2020 listed on the plan, and the key metric that was used there was a gallons of water saved per dollar invested. And so uh, we compared ourselves to low flow fixtures, which actually are pretty expensive, surprisingly, and they save around um, three gallons per dollar invested. So we set a slightly higher bar at five dollars per gallon, and that's how we backed five gallons per, five dollar. gallons per dollar. Sorry, and that's how we backed into the price point. Um, as we scale up, we expect our hardware costs to drop, and we could pass those savings on to our customer. It's just in this initial phase, um, until we've really um, gotten going with the contract manufacturer, we feel we need that higher price point to make sure we're financially sure sustainable. Price is it a cost base? It's a it's a savings based cost. Correct. Uh, okay, good. That's yeah. good to know. Good question from the judge. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have another one for Aquas. Um, can you quantify the environmental impact in terms of plastic saved and carbon values? Uh, it, it varies a lot. Um, not only the strategy of what people are using, what we're using before, but there's some people are buying wood, uh, charcoal to boil, or even contributing to deforestation. Yeah. I wish I could remember the, the, the number right now, but it would be, it's, it's it really it just astonishing. I was surprised by how many of those hands that I mean, every single day using a, a water bottle to basically replace one or two bottles a day for a year to prevent the deforest, deforestation. And just the amount of impact that comes from cutting down one tree isn't just the tree and the, 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 the carbon emitted from the Short answer, no, but long answer, it's <laughs> I'm not sure if I should call it solving shit or not, but whatever <laughs> your company is, um, the processing seems like that's the key. So how long does it take and the ingredients and who, who handles all that? Yep, so the actual process is why we chose the type of digesters we did is that it requires almost no maintenance. You mix the waste in an inlet with a metal mixing device, uh, flow it into the digester. It has a retention time, so the waste sits for about 35 to 45 days, depending on what waste is going in, so how long it takes for the pathogens to break down. But So waste, call it 45 days to break down, and to actually build and get the process up and running takes about three weeks to build and then another two weeks to actually have the digesters running. Will there be any, I mean one of the things that came to my mind when we were looking at that is, at least in America, a lot of things go down the toilet and that shouldn't be, and I don't think in your system it will be, but if somebody does start to dispose of you know, cleaning supplies and those get into the digesters, it'll probably cause a problem is there going to be some expertise to be able to handle digesters. So kind of on two ends. The digester end, uh, with the maintenance, really all that is is if you see drops in gas production or any kind of big signs like that, you would stop the flow of waste, empty it out, and then just remove any of those inorganics, etc. And so that's usually about every three years, unless you're putting in just crazy amounts. But then on the other end, we're looking at implementing screening on the toilet end. So they absolutely do have diapers. They've set diapers to forks to really anything people throw in, like these pit latrines and other types of toilets they have. And so we have looked into dealing with that on both the toilet end, but also on the processing end. To touch on that a little bit more, we have two, right now he talks about having a filter screen on the toilet. There's actually another process that's an intermediary process between the actual transportation of the large mass to the processing plant. There's a truck that we're thinking about implementing, which basically takes out all the liquid and all the unnecessary water that we need from the waste and kind of gets like a higher efficiency waste, which also has a filtering aspect to it. So at that stage, that would be like the second sort of filtering stage, so that would ensure that there will be a lot less stuff. Going to the actual facility. 
Yeah, so it's a membrane de sludge dewatering vehicle. Uh, they're, they've been designed for India, low cost, and it helps with removing up to 90% of the actual volume of waste that we be transported. And so that can be emitted. The water can be disposed of on site as it's getting pumped out. One more question for Plant uh, Big problem, obviously. It's astonishing how little we teach about nutrition in our schools uh, and what we feed in schools. Uh, have you, and, but selling to schools is difficult. Identified. Have you looked at any organizations that are already sort of in there doing not the same thing but similar things? So maybe you could align with them, like uh, the Kitchen Community, Kimball Mosques. He's already done like 40 schools, I think, there's some in LA as well. And so they're they're bringing plant gardens to schools and they're teaching nutrition. And you're sort of something like that. Mm, yeah, so in our customer discovery, which is how we landed on working with the nonprofits, the customers were working with your already implementing garden programs. So there's one in Northern California that's doing outdoor gardens and they're interested in bringing in some more of the STEM learnings. And so that's how we were able to start working with them. But that market, as you've identified, is really important for us because they're already doing something that and have identified that need within the school. So our product can bring in the science and another way of teaching them about gardening and food and nutrition with this other aspect of education, which provides the validation we need to actually start working with the schools themselves. They're not going to spend money on something that we say is great. They need to know that it's great and it's solving what they need. Do you consider yourself a product company first or a curriculum? Uh, I think we're still trying to figure that out. Um, I think eventually we will be curriculum first and products will align. We've had people talk about, well, how could we take little planty and build one in the cafeteria and so we're like, oh yeah, we can do that. So I think the curriculum is the biggest piece about teaching towards these NGSS standards and food and nutrition. And really, as long as it aligns with whatever medium we're using, I think eventually we'll move towards that. But the product is the, the package right now. Right. And in the vehicle, so the teachers have these standards and they have, unless the teacher gets really excited about teaching food and nutrition, they don't really have a vehicle to do it or the standards in which they can teach it. So bringing in the STEM, science and engineering and math elements, it allows them to have a platform and be able to do it in a way that's really in the classroom, aligned with what they already need to teach. Great. Thank you all so much. We're going to hold you guys up here. Um, judges, we're going to open it up to deliberation now. You guys, great job. They're all So welcome back to the decisive moment of our day. Um, I, I have heard feedback both through texting throughout the process and, and just now that this was an extraordinarily hard decision to make. Um, the presentations were fantastic. So what I would like to start with is our third place winner. And our third place winner is Believe in Bambara. Tassie and the Marshall School of Business. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Our second place winner is Reflow. So each of you have the uh, 
Each of you should be very happy that you were in our inaugural class for this competition. We will do this yearly. We're really, really happy with how, um, how seriously everybody took this and what great ideas you have. And we can't, um, we wish you the best with all of your ideas. Um, JR and Todd, a special thanks to you two. You really put out for this competition, really helped with um, our candidates refining their projects.